So for our Nordic audience that might not be as familiar with the Wirecard story, um, can't you just give a brief outline of what is the story here? So it's a bit of a crazy story. What you have is this European fintech company. It has something to do with payments. I mean, it calls itself the European PayPal. And what happens is, I mean, I think the easiest way to talk about it is the story of Money Man, the book, and the investigation is about the investigation that I did into the company. And eight years ago, I'm chatting to an investor and he says to me, hey, Dan, would you be interested in some German gangsters? So I say, yeah, sure, it's interesting. Definitely. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't be, right? I mean, right? I'm a journalist and you're like, oh, you've got my attention right there. And so I start to look at this company. He tells me it's called Wirecard. And it's a tech company. It moves money around. And it seems to be too good to be true. It's growing really, really fast. It's really, really profitable. And in a way that is quite unusual. And when I look into it, there are basically two theories about what's going on. One is that it's a little bit fraudy. Maybe they're inventing their profits. And the other is maybe they're laundering money. If they're moving money around, then maybe they're helping every nasty type of business that you might imagine online to get paid for doing it. And quite a lot happens, but this company goes from being a small little fintech that nobody's heard of to one of the largest and most successful companies in Germany. It goes into the DAX 30 index. Um, it's seen as sort of the next big thing. Finally, Europe has a big tech company to rival the giants of Silicon Valley. But I keep on investigating it, and um, in June 2020, as a result of sort of my reporting, the whole thing blows up. It's rotten from top to bottom, and it's exposed as a giant fraud. Because I've read the book, and it's great, and uh, it turns out uh, they invented $1.9 billion on their balance sheet, cash that didn't exist at all. So that was a huge... And yeah, I was and just so it's just such a interesting story like how did how did you see it for all that time and nobody else and institutional investors kept buying the shares the German media was so supportive of the company and even the regulators in Germany still kept on supporting this company but you you were so sure there was something fishy going on how did you guys see it Yeah because one of the crazy things about it is all of this stuff that you just wouldn't imagine happening in real life comes up in the story and it starts to feel like, you know, we're living in some sort of, you know, summer spy thriller. And to begin with, it starts out with that um, each interaction with the company is a little bit strange, a little bit off kilter. So, you know, to give you a couple of examples, when I... Um, when I first get in touch with them, knock on the door, say, hi, I'm from the Financial Times. You're an up-and-coming fintech. Let me write about you. And they're kind of like, no, thanks. Not really <laughs> interested in publicity. <laughs> and you're like, uh, well, that's weird. And then I send them some questions going, I've had a look at you know, your accounts. Some things seem a bit unusual. And they come back and say, well, this is very suspicious. Some hedge funds were asking us some very similar questions. Um, are you in league with them? We're concerned the young newspaper might be naively giving credence to their crazy theories. And you're kind of like, oh, we've hit a nerve here. Yeah, <laughs> something is going on. It's so because uh, the the whole story exploded in the like uh, in uh, 2020 in April, was it or? So. It's at the start of 2019 that the story really explodes. Mm. So as we're reporting on it, there's this whole steady series of escalations. Things get weirder and weirder. And, you know, we start to realize hackers are trying to break into our email. 
There are private detectives running all over the place, intimidating people. But, you know, what happens in the first couple of years? You know, I talked about these two different theories, and they have quite a thorough airing. You know, I write about the accounting fraud. Some other guys write about the money laundering side of things. And um, nothing happens. The accountants, Ernst & Young, one of the world's most famous accounting firms, just keeps signing off every year, says everything's fine. And the German authorities investigate some of the critics of Wirecard. You know, say, oh, they're just trying to manipulate the share price. So everybody basically gives up. And the key moment, the absolute breakthrough, is in October 2018. So Wirecard has just entered the DAX index. It's worth almost $30 billion at this stage. And, you know, the chief executive has been treated like some sort of tech visionary. You know, he, he talks in all this sort of nonsense about a cashless future. And he starts dressing like he's Steve Jobs, the Apple founder. You know, black turtleneck strutting about, you know, with all this sort of meaningless phrases. But at that moment, something amazing happens. This whistleblower gets in touch with me. And they're in Singapore, and they've encountered a whole bunch of little frauds going on in the Singapore office. You know, backdated contracts, people forging invoices, you know, trying to send two million euros out the door to their friends. But the weird thing is, when they conduct a whole investigation, you know, they bring in lawyers, they do everything correctly, suddenly realize this is getting quite serious and send it back to head office in Munich, and the whole thing's squashed. Mm -hmm. They go, thank you very much, we'll take care of it now. And one of the lawyers involved is forced out. Not but he realizes he's going to be forced out, and so he takes a copy of all of the documents. And because he's seen the stories that I'd written about Wirecard before, he gets in touch. Actually, it's, it's not him who gets in touch. It's his mother who gets in touch. And, uh, I mean, this incredible woman, she's, um, you know, she was born to seek immigrants and forced into this arranged marriage with this alcoholic who she eventually kicks out and raises her son herself and, you know, brings him up to do the right thing. And then when he's forced out of Wirecard, she's like, I am not going to let these guys get away with it. So he's busy looking for another job, and she starts contacting journalists, and I respond. And she tells him what's going on. He's like, oh, my God, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done? But he does the right thing, and he talks to me, and that is the big breakthrough. After sort of looking at it from the outside for years, suddenly... I'm on the inside, and that's when we can start to write some real stories. Because how many years have you been investigating the company at this point? So this was four years. Mm. And also, yeah, you've been four years until the whistleblower then contacts you? Yes. Yeah, and then, I mean, one of the crazy things is it then takes another year and a half to finally properly expose the company. That is like one of the, I read the book and I'm, I'm reading it and you are going with that first story and you call Wirecard, uh, ask for a comment and it's such like a big moment in the book and I'm like, oh, now, now it's getting exposed, but it takes another 18 months. And this is when it all starts to go completely crazy as well, isn't it? Yes, because completely. It has this quality of like sort of I mean, I say cat and mouse, but, you know, as I talk about in the book, we sort of, it was like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because I guess what's really interesting and sort of one of the broader lessons you can take from it is at the moment, at the start of January 2019, we're ready to publish our story, what the whistleblower has told us about Singapore and these fake contracts. And it's a great story, you know, fraud inside Wirecard's Asian head office. And so as soon as we publish it, the share price drops by about 8 billion euros. Which, you know, if you're looking at it, I, well, I mean, I remember looking at it going, blimey, I hope this story's right. 
um, it's sort of very exciting, but also, you know, a bit of a sick feeling in your stomach as well. Yeah. Um, but at that moment, we're only talking about, you know, 30 euros worth of fake contracts. Mm. And if Wirecard had said, yeah, you got us. Well done. Right. Yeah, we're going to clean up. We're going to fire everybody. Um, yeah, we really need to improve things. They might have got away with it. Mm. But they didn't do that because, as my boss says, you know, they're, a criminal, they're criminals. They can't think like a normal company. What they do instead is they deny everything and they basically attempt to frame me for insider trading, cooking up this story that I had leaked the story to some stock market speculators before it was published. And that almost worked. I mean, the German authorities started to investigate me and my colleagues. Um, they stopped a form of speculation known as short selling mm -hmm. in the company for two months. I mean, they did all sorts of things to protect the company. And they very nearly worked. But also what it meant was the Financial Times couldn't walk away from the story because they basically said the newspaper was corrupt. So it sort of becomes this battle between them or us. And it's so crazy that in this story, then suddenly instead of a wire card being the story, they turn it around and try to put it on the Financial Times. It's kind of putting the journalist on the spot instead of just... Uh, uh, it's actually it's so crazy. When I read the book, it was just like, are you kidding me? Just new situations and new situations, and just the, the, um, and also you looking at the people, the characters in Wirecard. You're just like, oh my god, why can't ev everyone see that these are just really fraudulent people? But it's nobody does that, and like the media protects them, and the regular re regulators don't do anything. It's so crazy. The, I mean, the characters are amazing, aren't they? Especially <laughs> Jan Marsalek. Yes, the COO. Who's this Austrian whiz kid? Like he drops out of high school to start a tech company. And he doesn't go to university. He doesn't even learn to drive, he says, because he's too busy. You know, this is a man in a hurry. And I think what you get to see is sort of, you know, part of this, a lot of the book is this sort of arc of his development. Because he's on the inside and I'm on the outside. And we never meet. We never even talk. But we're sort of in opposition to each other. And he somehow gets promoted way beyond his ability. And is constantly running around trying to keep the plate spinning. You know, coming up with these harebrained, sque coming up with these harebrained schemes. Which nearly destroy the company. But somehow he manages to like get through it and improvise some solution and get on to the next thing. But to the outside world, he is the most charming, charismatic person they have ever met. Like he wears these um, Keaton shirts, which are like a thousand dollars each and these amazing sharp suits. And you sort of see time and again, people come into his orbit and they start dressing like him. They just sort of, you know, get, com you know, what, what do you call it? That sort of reality distortion field. And so he is the bad guy and he seems to have completely charmed everyone. And then what I discovered sort of, you know, as the story goes on and more when I was researching the book is that he had some very strange friends. So he's trying to hang out with like a Libyan militia. Mm. <laughs> and... <laughs> and He's a workaholic, so he can't go on holiday. But then, you know, his friends are taking the mickey out of him, like, you know, why can't you relax? And he says, well, you know, what I, what I want to do is something nobody else in the world can do. So one of his friends, a Russian mercenary, who's just hanging out with him, says, tell you what, how about we go for a little stroll around Syria? Mm. My friends have just cleared um, Palmyra from ISIS, so we can go and take a look around. And that's the kind of thing he does to relax. And so, yeah, and so as we're sort of in this battle and we're trying to defend the reputation of the FT, prove the crooks, we start to learn 
Oh, well, hang on a second. This guy seems to be hanging out with some very dangerous people, and maybe Wirecard is protected after all. Yeah, because uh, yeah, because it is. Uh, yeah, that's also part of the book that I was also find so shocking. That but couldn't they just take a look at these people and understand that something really bad was going on? But one of the things I was also curious about is that, you know, there were real people working at Wirecard, thinking they were doing working at a big tech company, working on the future of payments. Like, why couldn't they see anything uh, either as well for? this many years like how were they able to keep it up internally because all of this fraud it was very much uh, located out in um in like regional offices that you know didn't exist but uh, yeah all the people at, at the headquarters what did they think well it's really interesting the lies we tell ourselves yeah. or the things we look past and forgive if you're emotionally invested in something you know like financially invested as well mm. so I spoke to a lot of the employees and Wirecard had about 6,000 staff and the great majority of them I think weren't directly involved in the fraud and what the company had was this great cover story which goes back to these two theories about it so what it said was to protect its reputation, when it got payments processing customers who were a little bit racy, you know, operating in grey areas, so it did, you know things like gambling, pornography, um, multi-level marketing schemes, Wirecard wouldn't process the payments for them itself. It would send them to a friend. And so the friend would take care of dealing with all the payments and things. And then it would sort of send back as a thank you a nice big fat commission. And so it turned out that Wirecard had three of these special friends. And by the time, you know, we get to this battle with EFT, they're responsible for half of the company's sales and basically all of its profits. And quite a few people inside Wirecard had noticed. Because, you know, they were literally asking the question, saying, well, hang on a second. If, like, six people can run this operation with Wirecard's friends and make all this money, what are the other 6,000 people doing? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, there was that sort of willful blindness you know, you can mm. literally see emails with people going, oh, is it that part of the business? Yeah, I don't want anything to do with that smiley face. You mm. know, they would sort of look away and go, uh, yeah, I don't really want to know about it. And so the, the sort of the money laundering became a cover story for the fraud. And that actually worked externally as well. Because I think a lot of responsible stock market investors looked at Wirecard and said, well, it's probably operating in these gray areas. You know, it's doing things like processing payments for online gambling and the, the international authorities don't seem to care about it. So if they don't, why should I? And that probably explains why it's so profitable and why it doesn't really talk about the details of its business. Mm. So what was the catalyst for sort of taking taking the the mum who then con connected you with uh, with the person giving you all the details regarding the office uh, that was fraudulent and sort of taking it to the place where you guys at the Financial Times could build a case and really yeah keep, be in the fight again basically. So what happened was the um, the mum put me in touch with her son. Um, a guy called Pav. He's, he, he, he's happy to, you know, be identified now that it's all over. And, um, and he sent me some key documents from their internal investigation. And, you know, I've got it on my phone. And I could sort of look at it. And I'm sort of scrolling down. It looks a bit sort of corporate. And then words start jumping out like fraud, money laundering, um, forgery. And so, you know. 
holy mackerel, this is the real deal. So I sort of jump on a plane to Singapore, go and meet him, and he sort of talks me through everything that he's happened. Or he talks me through everything that has happened to him. And so I spend three days there sort of going through every detail, trying to get the whole story. And then I come back and basically sit inside a bunker inside the Financial Times for two months going through these huge reams of documents. I mean, I had like entire inboxes from the guys who were doing it and could sort of map out the fraud, trying to get to the point where where we could say, okay, here's enough evidence, we can write the story. And then... All the stories that you wrote, it sparked an external audit eventually. That, uh, so that Wirecard had to take in, and uh, not just their regular auditor, EY, but uh, someone external to actually look at the document, look at their books. It's remarkable, isn't it? As a company, if you're accused of a serious crime. So October 2019... Or rather, it's wrong. If you're if you're a company accused of a serious crime, you get to investigate yourself. So we write a story in October 2019 saying this is how the fraud is happening. These are all the fake customers, and here are the underlying documents which prove it. And instead of the police knocking down the doors and saying, "Right, let's get to the bottom of this." Uh, Wirecard appoints a second accounting firm, KPMG, to come in and read all the work. And it all comes down to essentially two pieces of paper and the small matter of 1.9 billion euros. (laughs) And so the special order, you basically have a set of accountants from KPMG, a set of accountants from EY, and a bunch of Wirecard lawyers. And they all decide that they need to go to the Philippines because (laughs) this is where Wirecard has told them all the money is and to meet the lawyer who is looking after this money because it's in special bank accounts uh, set up between Wirecard and its special friends. So they all fly to Manila and they go to the office of this lawyer and they walk in and discover it has a YouTube studio in it. (laughs) <laughs> and and the guy who is looking after all this money for this European financial institution has a YouTube channel with 100,000 subscribers. He's got one of those little plaques. And he gives advice on things like divorce and family law. And he walks in and he's like, spends half an hour talking about how important and influential he is. You know, he knows the president. He went to university with him. And all of this sort of mad things. And all the accountants and lawyers are sitting there sort of watching this, half going, what is this weird, crazy thing that's happening to us? (laughs) But at the same time, they're like, at least I can put a tick in my box now. You know, Mm. something's happening. It's It's not that there's nobody here. And so they go downstairs and there are cars waiting for them with a police motorcycle escort. And they jump in and, you know, and the lawyers are thinking, well, we're right next to the financial district. We're right next to the financial district. We'll probably just pop over there to head office and find out about these accounts. And then they drive with these police guys, lights flashing, for 40 minutes and pull up, at, pull up on some sort of dirt road where, you know, there's a garage, there's a bicycle shop, there's, like, dogs running around. And they go into this tiny little bank branch where there's barely enough room for this big group of German businessmen in suits. And one little guy pops up and is like, hi, hi, yes, can I help you? (laughs) And they're like, hi, yeah, we're here to talk about Wirecard. He's like, Wirecard, (laughs) what? And he looks at the (laughs) lawyer and he's like, ah, Wirecard, yes. (laughs) <laughs> and he produces an envelope and he hands the envelope to the lawyer and the lawyer hands the envelope to the accountants. And inside is a piece of paper which says, yes, there are three of these special bank accounts and there's a billion euros in them. <laughs> and there, there are, 
you know, two of my favorite touches about that particular letter is that there are spelling mistakes in it. Mm. Like <laughs> they, they misspell the name of one of the subsidiaries, one of the wire card companies, which is supposedly holding the money. And the other is that it's signed by the assistant branch manager. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the basis for, you know, Wirecard's whole business, two, you know, billions in cash. And, um, and like, the, one of the incredible thing is it still takes another three months before the whole thing is exposed and uh, Wirecard comes crashing down. Uh, it's, it's just so crazy for how long they were able to, like, hold this scam up and just also how incredible sales number they reported on each year it wasn't just like a little scam it was just like billions invented year over year over year and i'm just thinking it must have taken so much to just keep this up the work, by the people it, yeah i mean the work involved to just keep everything in motion i mean by that point you might as well be running a real business because it's sort of constant and I mean, I like to think, you know, what must the pressure be like? Mm. Yeah, for the people. I'm, yeah, just for years. And it's not just like a little period of time. It's years. In your I mean, book, it, you say, you allude to that. You think that the fraud kind of started back in 2010. So then it's actually 10 years of just persistent accounting fraud. Yeah. And the lesson is, I think, that small crimes become big ones. Mm. So... You know, the simple history of Wirecard is that, you know, a distributor for Vans trainers sits next to a pornographer on a plane. And he ends up getting into the business. But he needs some way to take payments, so he starts the company, which is Wirecard. And everybody keeps doubling down and doubling down again. And it becomes this very large and profitable business. But... It's basically money laundering and the world changes and, you know, it becomes more dangerous and, you know, porn and gambling aren't the same businesses in 2010 that they were at the start of the internet. And, and basically our guy, Jan Marsalek, he gets put in charge and he's been overpromoted. He's still very charming, but he doesn't know what he's doing. And he's sort of scrabbling around for the next big thing. And that's the moment when someone who uh, the Atlantic calls the Dark Lord of the Internet shows up. <laughs> and it's basically, um, there was a period back in the late noughties when everywhere you looked online were adverts for things like acai berries. Um, Sort of acai berry, you know, with super anti, super mm. antioxidants, and you know they would help with weight loss, with everything else. Basic uh, sort of nutraceuticals, I think, is mm. the word. And this business that they found was basically rampaging around the world, stealing money from people by sort of signing them up for free trials for acai berries and things like that. And as soon as they got their credit card, they would just hit it with as many charges as possible. Um, and for a very short space of time, it's this amazing business. And then the whole thing blows up because of your, because the whole thing blows up because the US authorities come in and shut it all down. And that's the moment where I think Wirecard wants to keep growing, wants to keep giving its good numbers to the stock market, and it has to turn to fraud to try and make up the difference. So you mentioned that they did a lot of money laundering with these funds. So how? How did they do it? Like, what was the scheme going on to launder these illicit funds? So... What they were quite clever about was doing different things in different jurisdictions. So to give you an example, they would be processing payments for online gambling 
in the US, which was illegal. But they would miscode the payments. So instead of saying, you know, so as, it, as everything went through, you know, the visa system, um, it would appear in your credit card statement as like you just purchased golf balls or flowers um, instead of visiting, you know, an online casino. And the money would be processed through Wirecard in Germany. It would legally then go through a shell company based in the north of England, where, um, you know, the directors of that company would have been recruited from a local pub, paid mm. 50 pounds to put their names on the documents and not to ask any questions. And then the money would go from there to a tax haven like um, Mauritius or, you know, the British Virgin Islands. And so no one authority really sees the whole thing. And, you know, one, you know, one of the great ironies in the story is that there are these moments when different authorities try to investigate or could have investigated. And, you know, the U.S. Department of Justice actually does try to do it. But the Germans don't seem particularly interested in helping. Mm. And so nothing happens. But that's got to be one of the key takeaways, I think, in terms of the modern economy as well, in terms of how do you regulate a fintech company? So I'm curious, what are your thoughts on, on that matter? Like, obviously, it didn't really work in, in the way the wire card uh, company was, was regulated. Uh, as you mentioned now, different jurisdictions or different regulators leading to conflict, leading to less interest maybe from one part that just basically blocks the investigation. So what, what should we as a society take away from this? I think several different jurisdictions all show a general lack of interest in financial crime. And I think the broad principle or lesson is that if you want to stop gigantic financial crimes like Wirecard, you have to start with small ones because then you'll get practiced at prosecuting them. You'll learn how to detect them and you'll also stop them before they become gigantic crimes. And, you know, that, you know, we can point a finger at Germany and say they should have done more, but also London was home to a lot of the enablers the lawyers, the private detectives who sort of helped protect Wirecard. And also one of these paperwork factories that they used was up in the north of England as well. And that was just abusing weaknesses in the UK system of corporate regulation. So, I mean, the one thing that I would love to see and I think would solve a tremendous amount of problems all over the world is very simple. Publish the identity of ultimate <clears throat> publish the identity of ultimate beneficial owners of all companies you know a limited company is a privilege it protects you from unlimited liability so that you can't be sued out of existence you can take it, you can experiment you can launch businesses without the risk that you lose everything and that is great and very valuable but it should also come with some responsibilities to mm. identify yourself to the rest of the world. I think the trend is that, like, we are here in the Nordics, of course, and, you know, uh, corporate information has been public for a long time. So these are public registers that are being updated. But I think the trend is that it's going more and more in that direction as well, although it might take a little, little longer to get the all ownership registers uh, openly available. And I think there are people who could put pressure on the places where that isn't happening. Because, yes, so the Nordics are quite good in terms of public accountability and identity. But what about all your private equity companies? Mm. You know, what about all your companies who are using uh, shell companies or corporate structures in notable tax havens? Fine, there mm. might be legitimate reasons for them, but why don't they own up. Why doesn't everybody put pressure on these jurisdictions to publish UBOs mm. and all the rest of it? 
think it's uh, yeah, it, it's so interesting, and it's like looking at this huge scandal, this huge story, um, which has been public for so many years, and the unwillingness to sort of pursue it. It alludes to some sort of corruption in some cases as well. And if we're talking about regulations, obviously corruption is something we need to battle as well. Uh, so I think that's a big catalyst in, in this story, uh, getting everyone on board, basically, of, uh, of creating a UBO register across the world will be an immense challenge, but everyone needs to be, a, yeah, a basically a thumbs up vote in terms of getting it done. I was also, when I was reading your book, it was like, oh, we need more. You just realize why we have regulation, why the financial system is regulated and why we need strong regulators. And you, you start thinking about like, hmm, decentralized finance, should everybody really be able to do what they do? You kind of, I had a big step uh, towards, okay, we need just more regulations. And it's a reason why, you know, sensitive stuff as the financial system is regulated. I completely agree. I mean, I think if we wait a few more months, the decentralized financial system might have blown itself up entirely. So uh, <laughs> we may not have to worry about yeah. that too long. One of the also things I thought about when I read your book, like obviously Wirecard is a huge scandal, but then throughout the book, you kind of casually named up some fellow journalist friends or other in the financial, like the financial sphere who has the uh, um, uncovered some other frauds, like other companies that had invented a mine or invented balance sheets or these kinds of things. So I was also just uh, uh, curious to know, do you think there's a lot of other frauds out there that are just waiting to be uncovered? Yeah, I mean, part of the fun of the book was both telling the side of the story that no one knew. You know, finally, I could talk about all the crazy things which happened to us. But also put in that context because these are age-old tales, you know, greed, believing things are too good to be true, and you see them time and again, and, you know, every sort of cycle or every however long it takes, you know, what's it, 20 years since Enron, the big U.S. energy company, mm. was shown to be a complete fraud. So every so often, a really big one comes along and grabs your attention. But I think there's a lot more out there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the next one will be? Are you working on a story <laughs> right now? <laughs> I have some very promising and interesting leads, that's for sure. During investigation of the Wirecard story, what was the craziest thing that you that happened to you and the team? During the Wirecard investigation, lots of crazy things happened. But as it's reaching its peak, and we're in this battle with this huge technology company, I'm saying it's a fraud. I've ended up investigated by the police for writing stories in a newspaper. And we're trying to convince everyone that we're right. And suddenly my boss pulls me, pulls me to one side and says, Dan, we need to have a talk away from any electronics. So we put our phones down. We go to a room with no windows inside the building. And he's like, there's something I've been meaning to tell you. There's a Russian angle here. One of the main executives, the one who we knew had been pushing back against us, well, he seems to have some Russian friends. He's been trying to impress speculators in London by waving around some top secret documents which have the recipe for the Russian nerve gas Novichok on them. I'm kind of looking at him going, what the holy what are you talking about? <laughs> And it was at that point that you start to think, hang on a second, who is protecting this company? Oh, it's such a crazy story. Like, why <laughs> would perfect. someone working in payments have that recipe? Yeah. Uh, I was also just uh, wondering if, because uh, sometimes, like, yeah, on several occasions in the book, like, you guys go and kind of, okay, let's see the wire card offices, the, the friend, the, you know, the three parties, um, like external uh, companies in Singapore and Bahrain and in and uh, Philippines, and there's nothing really there. So, which is also just like, why didn't anyone just go and see that nobody billions can't be made here at like some little outlet with no people? Um, I was just wondering maybe we could uh, 
Like if you could tell one of those stories, because I think those okay. are like so good. Well, it's just because we because there is a documentary coming out on work okay, okay. in the autumn. Mm. Nice. Um, so I don't want to preempt too much of mm. it. Um, but so I was actually thinking because um, also that com- that story is slightly complicated. But um, yeah, that's true. Um, so we send one of my colleagues, Tefania Palmer, to the Philippines because we're looking for the smoking gun here. What is it that is going to prove to the world that this company is a fake, that there's a big lie at the heart of it, and it's not what it seems? So she goes and finds this business, which is supposedly one of Wirecard's best customers. And it's in a shopping mall in Manila. And she walks up to the office, and there on the window, there are a bunch of stickers that say, yeah, this is a payments company. But on the other window, there's also stickers for a tour bus company, which takes (laughs) tourists to the casino. (laughs) And so she goes inside, and there are bus drivers walking in and out. And, you know, you can get tickets to go to whichever casino you want to, but there doesn't seem to be any payments processing happening anywhere. And that was kind of one of the moments where you're like, this is it. There's really nothing to this at all. How are they lying to the world? Oh, it's wow. so crazy. It's so crazy that it that that's the story. And that nobody else kind of just went there and looked at it and just saw, okay, hey guys, this is just not possible to be this isn't this isn't true. It's just nothing here. What yeah. what do you think uh, Did really no one else go besides you guys and just look into this? None of the institutional investors, nobody? But what do you think you have done that sort of people in general don't that makes you able to just number one spot and find out that this is probably something we need to investigate and also have the sort of nerves to follow it along and in yeah uh, having to battle basically to get the truth out there a lot of people would have just given up like a long time ago so what do you think is special about you for getting this one over the line i mean i think for me wirecard became a little bit of an obsession because it was a puzzle that I really had to solve. You know, where is its money coming from? What is really going on inside it? And I just couldn't leave it alone, a bit like a dog with a bone. I, you know, it gnawed away at me and I wanted to solve it. And also because we'd encountered so many dirty tricks. You know, at one point there was $10 million on the table to make the stories about Wirecard go away. Presented to you? Presented to my boss. Mm. And when that sort of stuff happens, that is so far beyond the realm of experience. Mm. Of anyone at the Financial Times, we're like, okay, there's definitely something up here. But it was never anything that we could write. They were too clever about it. And so I think I was just determined to get to the bottom of it and was convinced that I was right. But that's quite unusual. Most people are just looking for a good stock market investment. Mm. And they don't need to do that much work. You just have to satisfy yourself. Is this a good bet? And besides, I've got a hundred other companies I'm investing in. I don't need to spend too much time. It's growing quickly. I like their chief executive. He's a charming chap. Um, You know, what more do you need? And so, and I actually spoke to um, an investor, actually spoke to an investigator, Susanna Krober, who did go and do some great due diligence. She went and knocked on doors all over Asia. And she told me, you know, she's standing on a dirt track looking for an address which doesn't seem to exist, you know, in an area which is notable for some pretty disreputable businesses blazing sun, really humid. And she's like, what am I doing here? Like, I'm going half mad looking for a non-existent building. Who in their right mind is going to do this just for a stock market investment? Mm. Mm, True. How has this uh, story and exposing it changed your life? 
or the impact it's had? Um, I mean, it's been terrific. <laughs> the, <laughs> I mean, the, you know, I've been able to write a book and the joy of it is to sort of reveal all of the journalism that people don't normally know about mm. and to tell all these unbelievable things which happen. So, you know, as a journalist, to be given the gift of such a crazy story, you know, to have whistleblowers trust you to get the truth out. Mm. I mean, it's the best job in the world. So I consider myself very lucky to have done it. And, um, and yeah, it's sort of, it's great fun talking about these uh, crazy stories, isn't it? If you were to start looking into a similar sort of situation, again, now, knowing sort of all the investigations that you've, or, or investigative work that you've done, where would you start this time around? Uh, so the thing I always say, the thing I always say is that stories get stories. So as a journalist, if you write about fraud, people know that you're interested in fraud. And so they approach you and say, hey, that here's something you should look at. So yes, you can do lots of clever financial analysis. Um, you can, you know, can run screens to look for companies. You can do all sorts of things. But really, I think a lot of journalism is just about people, getting good sources, finding experts who know what they're talking about, and getting them to tell you interesting things. So fi a final question. So, you know, we have uh, our main audience is the people who work with fight to fight financial crime, but mainly inside uh, businesses uh, that are um, within payments and banking and insurance and and so forth do you have any tips for them on uh, yeah on how they can um, continue the fight against financial crime if, from a journalistic perspective um, well if they come across some outrageous criminal behavior that needs to be exposed um, I'm at FD on Twitter and uh, <laughs> they should know where to uh, get in touch brilliant oh, brilliant okay that's a wrap really pleased to have you on the show and Dan so happy that you can join us and talk to us about the story on Wirecard yeah amazingly interesting so yeah super interesting listen to you, listening to you Dan have a great summer thank you so much for having me on and for the interest Yeah,